Welcome to another episode of the Phoenix Rising Podcast, Journeys of Descending into the Mysteries and Rising from the Roots. I am your host, Lisa Hillier, spiritual mentor and priestess. I have guided hundreds of women into the mysteries within them through my one-to-one mentorship, online courses, and Patreon portal. And today I have Finian Makepeace on the show with me. Finian is the co-founder and chief strategy officer of Kiss the Ground. Finian is also a renowned presenter, media creator, and thought leader in the field of regenerative agriculture and soil health. He's developed training programs, workshops, and talks designed to empower people to become confident messengers and advocates for this growing movement. He has worked with leading experts, policymakers, farmers, and businesses to make rebuilding soil through the adoption of regenerative agriculture a key solution to our world's biggest crisis. His greatest hope is that through awakening to the opportunities of regeneration, people know they can help change the world. He believes that with enough new advocates promoting the ancient wisdom, pioneering holistic thinking, and new science of regenerative agriculture and ecosystem restoration, we can heal our planet together. This is such a beautiful episode full of wisdom and inspiration on how we can shift the world at this time. Welcome to another episode on the Phoenix Rising podcast, and I am here with Finian Make Peace from Kiss the Ground, and Kiss the Ground is one of my most favorite documentaries ever. It was so inspiring and just like felt like such hope when we can see the alternative out there in the world right now. So I'm excited to see where this conversation goes and to just learn about Kiss the Ground and all the magic and medicine that it offers. So welcome, Finian. And to start, let's dive into what is regenerative uh, agriculture? What was the mission, the purpose behind Kiss the Ground and and what it's offered the world? Mm. Those are two separate big things. Should I start with what is regenerative ag or start with Kiss the Ground? Let's start with regenerative agriculture. Let's go there. Great. I, I personally have a mission to simplify this for people. Uh, there are countless um, long, medium, short, written descriptions of what regenerative agriculture is. So many of them are awesome and epic. For the lay person, I think it's important that we simplify it. And the way I do that is look at the two words, regenerative and agriculture. Agriculture humans creating food, fiber, and fuel, right? How we do that, that's agriculture. Regenerative means itself. Regeneration means something. It means something is headed back or reconstructing or healing itself back to its highest functioning state. Regeneration, right? A lizard's tail falls off. It's not a fully functioning lizard. Grows back its tail. Tail regenerates. You get a gash and wound in your arm. Your arm regenerates itself back to functioning again, right? So regeneration means something. It means an outcome. So when we take the word regenerative or regeneration and add it to agriculture, it's agriculture that's causing regeneration, causing the self-healing process that brings something back to its highest functioning state. So as much as we can talk about the outcomes in descriptions of regenerative agriculture or how we can expand that even to to human and societal and and multiple other outcomes and meanings i think it's really important to just know the word regeneration understand how important it is it's not restore it's regeneration it's not sustain it's regeneration these these meanings are really important for why people are so excited about regenerative agriculture why are we so excited about regenerative agriculture? Honestly, because we're so far beyond uh, the ability to think sustaining will do. Uh, across the world, over 70% of land is heavily degraded worldwide. In the United States, over 50% of our soil in agriculture is heavily degraded. What does heavily degraded soil mean? It means the soil doesn't work. When rain falls on it, it doesn't absorb. 
take, for example, average infiltration rates in farm and ranch land around this country, when it rains a half an inch, it can take an hour for that half an inch of rain to infiltrate into the soil because the soil has been broken apart. The, the function of the soil, the design of the soil has been broken, doesn't work. Take healthy soil, regenerated functioning soil, half an inch of water infiltrating in under 10 seconds. All of the sudden, the water that the plants need to resist drought, the, the recirculation or the infiltration of water allowing for aquifers and springs to reappear and have long-term flowing water through the system, versus water hitting the ground, running off and having a drought the next day. Uh, that is what happens with broken, degraded soil. So unless we regenerate the soil, we do not have functioning water cycles, uh, energy cycles, nutrient cycles, they don't work. The soil has to work. So that is the, the short version of why regenerative agriculture is called regenerative agriculture and is so important is because we cannot sustain ourselves out of this mess we created. We can't combat climate change. <laughs> Just We can do a little less harm here and there, but unless we restore the function of land, we can't even handle a two inch rain event without flooding happening in a lot of areas. Nature designed itself to handle five inch, 20 inch rain events. That's the beauty and the amazing technology that took over 500 million years for the soil system, the fungi system, the bacteria system, the plant system, working together to create epic sponge-like soil that functions, it makes us resilient, makes us abundant. So regenerative agriculture regenerates the land. It restores its function. And that's where I feel like we can hold on to the words. Different than even saying something's organic or agroecology, these are definitions that came about around how farming systems happen. Regenerative is the umbrella. You can have a conventional farm that is regenerative. It's regenerating how the landscape functions. You can have an organic farm that's regenerative. You can have a biodynamic farm that's regenerative. All of these things can be regenerative. Regenerative is an outcome-based word, and that's, I think, just crucial for people to get. This isn't just another name that we're putting meaning to. It means itself. So that's the first thing on why regenerative agriculture. Wow. Beautiful. I, I live on the West coast in Canada. I live in a rainforest and it has only rained five times since I've moved here, which is over three months ago. And so we're preparing ourselves kind of for another flood, like what happened last year, because as soon as the rain comes, even though I'm in a rainforest, the, the soil can't absorb it. So it creates these floods. It was wild last year. What happened with the floods on the, on the West coast. So it's kind of like you can see, I can see exactly what you're speaking to and how it's affecting the, the soil, the land and everything, because it's just not absorbing what it needs to absorb. Yeah. And here, so, here, here's a, mm -hmm. here's a great picture of that really quick. Muddy rivers are a human invention. Mm -hmm. Unless there's some cataclysmic mudslide or some just insane downpour, like there is exceptions to that, but generally heavy rains creating muddy rivers Nature didn't invent that. Why do we know that? Because soil building takes time. If we had yearly rainfalls that were creating as much muddy rivers as they are now, we would not have any topsoil ever. The world would never have built more topsoil if we're, if we were always losing it. So seeing muddy rivers as we pass by after a rainstorm, that is not normal. That is called the land isn't working. It hasn't been covered with living plants. It isn't absorbing the water in, it's allowing the water to run off. Sorry, side note, to put it in people's heads, like when you see tilled fields that are bare and muddy water after rain, it's not supposed to happen. Nature didn't evolve that way. It's a red flag. Yeah, totally. It's happening. So with that, you spoke to anything can be regenerative, like farms can be regenerative, organic farms, farms can be regenerative. And so with that, we see... Um, monoculture farms around the world, uh, very robotic, kind of meant to create one field of, you know, let's say wheat, for example. Mm -hmm. How do those farms that already exist shift into becoming a regenerative farm? Great question. These are all things that we've, we've, we've black and whited a lot of things of just like, this is bad. Cows are bad. Monoculture is bad, right? 
But then you're like, okay, there's cash crops. We're starting now. We're not all of a sudden going to just stop doing all the cash crops that are large fields doing one thing. We can do, uh, we can we can constantly increase the ability to do multi-species uh, grains or multi-species phenomenons or intercropping. We can do all that. We can do more silvopasture. We can do more agroforestry systems, of course. But we can also start with where we are, and we can have a corn and soy farmer, for example, Rick Clark, who uh, I just had worked with him for our Regenerate America campaign. And we had Rick Clark testify to the House Ag Committee uh, on September 14th. This was the first hearing on regenerative agriculture ever for the US Congress. And he has a 7,000 acre row crop farm in Indiana. He does cover cropping, multi-species cover cropping on his, when his cash crops are done, he plants uh, over them with multi-species cover crop so that the whole winter season, there's growing plants that are uh, protecting the soil, pumping carbon in. Uh, and then when he's ready to plant his cash crop, he roller crimps, instead of using chemicals to terminate his cover crop, he roller crimps them with a roller crimper. You can look up how those work, pushes all them down and direct seeds instantly, direct seeds his cash crops into that rolled down crimped cover crop uh, and gets a full, full yield of whatever that crop is the whole time protecting the soil and building soil health. He now has infiltration rates of 20 inches of water per hour. His neighbors have half an inch water infiltration per hour. Uh, he has over a million earthworms per acre and his neighbors have some, you know, 300, 400 worms per acre. So the, the ability to regenerate our soils can happen at scale, can happen where we are right now. Do we wanna change our commodity driven insane agriculture system? Of course, uh, but we can start today anywhere anyhow with what we got and start regenerating it so cover crop i think that's the word that you use yeah that's right? a very in, very important word yes cover crops um these are best done when they're multi-species not always contextually it doesn't always work like that but cover crops are essentially the the biggest bane in agriculture arguably is when farmers uh are done harvesting their cash crop that's the crop they're going to sell they harvest mm -hmm. it and then they till up their fields to suppress weeds and then leave those fields bare, no plants covering the soil for the entire winter or whatever months they, they're out of commission for a little while. And then they replant into that when they can. But let's just take a quick pause to have your listeners be reminded of how soil is built and protected in the first place, plants. Plants, we must, some of us learned in high school that plants pull in CO2, right? And breathe out oxygen. Well, they pull in CO2 combine carbon from carbon dioxide with hydrogen and oxygen to create uh, liquid carbohydrates. That's what they feed themselves with. That's the building block of this tree. Let's just come over to a tree for a second. This is carbon. Where did the carbon come from? Thin air that's all around us. So the plant through its leaf pulls in the carbon and creates this liquid sugar. You know how sap, when you break a twig and there's like liquid coming out, mm -hmm. that's liquid carbon that the plant uses to build its entire body. What we didn't know was that 30 to 40% of that liquid sugar constantly or not constantly throughout the year, different increments is being leaked out of the roots. Pretend my fingers are the roots. They're dripping out liquid sugar all over, all around, leaking it out, exuding it. Why? They're feeding microbes in the soil, the fungi, the bacteria, and countless other uh, uh, soil, soil microorganisms who in exchange are using enzymes to make minerals in the soil profile available, plant available for the plant. Then the plant around its root zone can then suck up those nutrients that the microorganisms made available. Microorganisms like fungi and bacteria also are making glues. Those glues are made of carbon because they ate carbon. They built themselves out of carbon. So those glues glue soil together. The gluing of soil together creates sponges that can hold 20 times their weight in water. These are, these are not only just uh, you know, metropolises for microorganisms to live, uh, they're also sponges that can hold so much water. So they're creating a hospitable environment for more water to infiltrate into the soil profile. The plant can have more water available. More microbes in the soil means the plant can have more nutrients available. The plant starts photosynthesizing more, more plants come up because there's more fertility, that means more carbon being pumped into the system. So reminder, without covering plants, you have a one-way system of microorganisms eating carbon that's in the soil and putting it into the atmosphere, creating CO2. So we have to cover the planet. 
with living plants. Otherwise, we cannot build soil and we cannot protect the soil from the elements. So living plants covering the ground, absolutely essential for farming to be regenerative. With that- That was a lot of information really fast, but here's the simple, (laughs) plants pumping carbon, microorganisms build it as soil. Plants pumping the carbon in, that's the only way to build properly functioning soil. Mm, I, I remember watching a documentary about trees and natural forests having the different levels of trees, kind of like the ferns and the shrubs at the base level and then the trees. And then you can look at like farmed forests or where they've been replanted and they don't have those different levels to the forest. It's just kind of the tree and moss and that's about it. And and so is that kind of speaking to the different levels and layers that need to take place with plants? Yeah, I mean, and there's gonna be different, depending on where you live in the world, there's gonna be different um, rates of that. So you know, I'm from New York, upstate New York, newly revealed wild that turns into a forest in like 30 years. But if you're out in the, in the West where it's naturally grassland, it's not necessarily gonna come back as a forest anytime uh, because it's not supposed to be. It's designed with deep rooted perennial grass systems that are incredibly good at handling droughts and incredibly good at handing handling major flood, random flood events, because their grasses, deep rooted grasses are like the most insane sponge water holding capacity, drought resilient systems in the, on the earth. And so that's why a third of land on earth is supposed to be grassland because it's, that's the habitat that it was adapted for. So not everything goes into a forest sooner or later, but I think you're also talking about the, the, the different um, levels because of, you know, maximizing photosynthetic capacity uh, you want to make sure that you're having different levels. So when you're creating a food forest, for example, um, you can utilize so much more of the top-down uh, maximization of photosynthesis, meaning the sun's energy you're converting into life energy, food. Beautiful. Yes. I'm, pro- I'm probably throwing a lot of information a little too quickly, so I can slow down if that's, if that's good. <laughs> no, that's perfect. I'll have to re-listen to it quite a few times to to catch the nuggets for sure, but that's beautiful. And so for the average person, you know, when you were speaking to crop covering with, um, with farmland, how can the average person start to instill that like in their backyard? Cause we have these lawns, you know, grass that we mow and, and all that kind of stuff. And then we have gardens that are just bare soil all winter or however it shows up. So how can we start to implement that in our backyard? Again, the context, uh, there's a phrase in regenerative ag, which is context, context, context. And this matters because context is king and it, it depends on where you are, what, you're gonna, what your plans are. Um, first off, covering the ground with living plants is really important. Um, a lot of demonization of lawns is legitimate because of how we take care of our lawns. You know, we, we have a lot of grasses that are super cut, super short, so they're not uh, protecting themselves from the heat. They're not, when you have super short grass, that means the root, root zones are also really short. So sometimes when you look at like, okay, my grass can grow to four inches, uh, my roots should be able to grow down plus six plus inches. Again, it also depends on the, on the grass. I'm out in Georgia right now, and all the lawns are planted with essentially a weed, which is a creeping grass that no matter how tall it gets, the root zones aren't helping build your soil profile because it's a creeping weed grass that people use for their lawn. So I'm like, you, you can't necessarily build soil with this grass no matter what you do. Maybe it helps protect it a little bit. So then you say, how do I minimize this grass? How do I turn more back into wild habitat? Uh, and for your gardens during your winter season, try cover cropping. Uh, if you're doing garden boxes, um, I would say the, the big thing about that is you know, where are you becoming a beacon for fertile fertility? Uh, a lot of people look around their neighborhoods and don't realize that they could become a compost center. They could take people's compost who aren't composting. Um, uh, makesoil.org is a great place. You can sign up to be a compost hub in your own community. But then like collecting your leaves and other people's grass clippings, uh, you can start churning out an incredible amount of fertility that gets put back into your raised beds, for example. Uh, and become something where you're bringing fertility around. And believe it or not, I mean, that's what's so crazy is people cut their grass and then they put it in the landfill or they get 
the the waste hauling people to come take it away and that's the crazy part like compost make a big compost during your backyard start composting that stuff uh because then you're creating fertility sometimes in covered uh cover cropping in your raised beds is is difficult just because of the nature of uh, that type of soil but if you have a bigger garden or small farm in your backyard definitely try cover cropping do multi-species uh that's a huge part of making sure you're getting the, the minerals and nutrients that you want made available from those cover crops plus you're protecting your soil so yeah if you're planting straight into the ground during the winter months for sure try to get your cover crop established early enough is that something people can do when they're in really cold climates like yeah if, if you get it established uh before the the cold cold hits um it'll grow enough that it'll protect your soil over the winter okay for sure okay let's go to kiss the ground and what was the mission behind that documentary and the yeah the medicine that it it birthed out into the world so kiss the ground uh the organization started about 10 years ago go um my friend and i and a few others but mostly my friend rylan and i um being kind of activists in our own right i I was civil rights activist environmental activist i was a musician as a job but really at my heart i was an activist and uh i thought i knew most of what there was to know about the climate change equation it was basically like how do we do a little less to go off the cliff a little less fast (laughs) that was the that was the scenario i was dealt in my late 20s Um, So I was like, okay, we got to do everything we can, but there wasn't anything that I saw that was matching the amount of damage we've caused. There wasn't any solution that was actually addressing it. It was, it was kind of like a little bit too late. Um, uh, While everything's well-intentioned and awesome, uh, not enough things to, to, to really change the trajectory we're on. So when I learned about soil health and the possibility uh, about 10 years ago from a guy named Graham Sait, it's a four hour lecture and truly mind bending and just eye opening. For me, um, I also have a past of growing up in Ithaca, New York and happened to be a part of a a 12th grade uh, AP bio class that was working with Cornell University to do soil sampling. And that soil sampling turned out to be studies they were doing that we're figuring out that trees, oak groves, were passing signals through mycorrhizal fungi underground to protect themselves from airborne viruses, uh, like some couple miles apart or something crazy. Uh, So I was just collecting soil samples, but all these research students were doing that. So long story short is when I was hearing this four hour lecture from Graham State, the amount of aha moments I was having around this were just insane. And that very night we went back and we're like, if this is all true, we absolutely have to help get the word out because there has never been an idea who, that is more prolific and more important to share with the world. And we're like, if we didn't know, probably most people didn't know. Like, truthfully, I was like, I'm pretty smart about, I, I thought I was. And lo and behold, it turned out, you know, most environmentalists, I think we did a calculation a couple of years into the org about eight years ago, we looked up like famous environmentalists and there was like 12, world famous environmentalists like Vandana Shiva was on that list. She was the only one at that time who really knew about soil health and the the opportunity here. And so you have to think about like how new this idea was to the, even the environmental world of soil, building soil, regenerating soil health. Um, So the mission of Kiss the Ground is awakening people to the possibilities of regeneration. That's what we do in everything from our media programs to our farmland programs that help farmers get trained in this to our education programs that help advocates get trained in this uh, to our policy program that helps change policy at the state federal level. Um, But about two years into Kiss the Ground forming, um, we we knew we had to make a big piece of media. And so we were able to convince Josh and Rebecca Tickell, who are famous filmmakers already uh, with, with films like Fuel and The Big Fix, We convinced them to make a a movie about dirt, which they didn't think was the sexiest thing, but they, they, they slowly, but surely got the aha moment and realized like, Oh, whoa, cause they, they got it. And so that took about seven years to make that film, but it, uh, and a lot of things got left on the cutting room floor. You know, a lot of pieces that we, we got some rightful flack about being left out of the film. Um, not inclusive enough, for example, uh, 
sometimes when you have multiple producers of a film that um, you don't get to tell the whole story. And so uh, we're still still working on making sure that the entirety of the story continues to get out there. But this film uh, in its versions has, I think over uh, uh, 10 million views on Netflix, a uh, billion impressions worldwide, um, is now helping transition in the U.S. alone over 34 million acres just through Understanding Ag, who some of the gentlemen from the film, like Ray Archuleta and Gabe Brown, a uh, the company they formed. Uh, incredible gains, 40,000 40, school screenings in the U.S. alone. Um, so incredible impact the film has had in terms of forwarding our mission of awakening people to this idea. And even on the, on the policy side, you know, the chairman of the House Ag Committee just credited us on September 14th with, you know, I had no idea, you know, here I am, the chairman of the House Ag Committee turning into the chairman, and I didn't know about this stuff. And so he, he credited us, the Secretary of Agriculture credited and kissed the ground of the work we've done with him as the reason he's prioritizing soil health uh, in his second term as the Secretary of Agriculture in the United States. So the film has had incredible, incredible impact around the world. And it's really, um, for those listening out there, uh, the role of the advocate is really, really important. We didn't come into this to be experts. Uh, we didn't come into this knowing, we came into it knowing we weren't the farmers, we weren't in the indigenous leaders, knowledge holders. We weren't the scientists, but we could champion them. We could help propel this story. And I think a lot of times people uh, don't take seriously how important that role is in contributing to movements and movement building is being the champion, being the person who's helping create a voice for those folks who are on the front lines doing this work, proving this, this is possible and making the, the true leadership happen. Uh, so I just want to throw out a message to everyone is the world needs you more than ever, especially since we've gained so much more fertile minds out there, people grasping this idea as possible. Now is the time we need countless advocates. Uh, and so one of the things that we, we've done at Kiss the Ground is create a soil advocate training program that allows people to go through a, a nine week course, like Al Gore made his climate reality project uh, trainings. We have an online course for people to become soil advocates so they can talk about this they can be you know from whatever stage they're at right now whether they're a farmer or a business owner a student um, parent whatever they are if they're passionate about this they can actually get trained in how to uh, prolifically share this with the world so mm, beautiful that's really powerful and I love the message of the film and just healing the soil. And I love that, you know, dirt isn't sexy because it is kind of like, oh, it's a, a documentary about healing dirt, but there's so much ancient wisdom in that and going back to the old ways of being in union with the earth. And I feel like at this time on the planet, there's such a call to go back to those more ancestral ways of living as opposed to separate from the yeah. earth. So it's, it's, it's so inspiring there's, and encouraging. There's, there's, I mean, so many of the leaders in this movement um, 100% bring in Indigenous knowledge as the basis of this. And so much of about it is mindset shift. I mean, a big reason we're at where we're at today is the historic mindset that dominated and became dominant across the world, arguably led mostly by you know, colonizing Western powers, but also other colonizing powers across the world in time. Uh, but colonizing powers usually tends to exploit and extract. Uh, but countless indigenous cultures, especially here in the United States, uh, my friend Lila June just came out with a TED talk. She's an indigenous woman from the U.S. She has a TEDx talk that people should check out. That's uh, she just did a big doctoral thesis on um, indigenous land stewardship and regenerative systems that. Uh, Native American people in the United States were very much doing, they were very much custodials of the land. And that mindset, though, is really what I think is at the basis of it. And what we're seeing and hoping is that the shift in agriculture towards more regenerative uh, has to be a mindset starting point. That's why education is, is critical. Uh, we have to shift how we're thinking as ourselves, as agents in this process. We can steward, and arguably we're the only animal right now with most of the incredibly degraded landscapes we're the only animal that can come in and, and repair it quickly quick enough beavers in some cases can but most cases we've degraded things and made them so arid that we have to go and help restore to shift toward nature self-healing versus in many places around the world it's still on a decline because we pushed it out of its uh, regenerative uh, capacity so 
this is the story that I think so many indigenous cultures have created in their, in their culture, because it's what led to their, their thriving and survival is working with nature. And we, I think across the world, humanity has kind of been usurped by the, the mindset of colonizing and extracting powers, which mm. I think just means humanity can reverse that. And we can do quite a lot quickly to restore this whole country and this whole world. Yeah. Yeah. How do animals, what part do animals play in healing the soil? Like cows, chickens? He, huge parts. Um, animal integration uh, is one of the principles of regenerative agriculture. And I encourage folks to look those up so they can get more familiar with them. But um, animals are arguably involved in every single landscape. And another reminder is like everything we see today is not how it's supposed to be. I know that sounds simple and kind of silly and stupid, but a lot of times like you're out in California, you're or, or, sorry, West Coast, but countless people in California being like, well, we live in a desert. What do you expect? And you're like, we made this desert. Are you kidding me? Like, take your head out of the sand here, buddy. Like we made this desert, the whole central um, driving up Highway 5 up the, the center of California, that large swaths of that were, were uh, wetlands and had the most diverse flower species in the entire world covering those places and just incredible abundance of water and animals. And so the animal uh, evolution, along with countless um, uh, ecosystems around the world, is just paramount. And we can't forget like grasses and herbivores work together. You know, why are grasses sweet? Why do they grow faster when an animal's saliva was on them? Like all of these things are just so inherent to evolution that when we help be practitioners to mimic how evolution was doing that prolifically, we were essentially cracking the code and helping uh, restore. And that's where cows can be some of the fastest regenerators on the planet, especially in arid environments. So um, yeah, incredible importance of integrating animals. So with Back that, into like, agriculture, they've been, de they've been decoupled, as you know, in the movie, it's like, we kind of decoupled animals and, you know, countless farmers and ranchers knew this worked, you know, a couple hundred years ago, uh, but we've been decoupling them with science and technology and big machines for, for a good 7,550 years here. So, mm, yeah. yeah. So with that, for, you know, the farmers or the gardeners, all that kind of stuff, those those types of spaces we'll call it is it like the manure from the cows and the chickens going into the soil is that part of the regenerative process to healing part the of soil? it part of it yeah so um footprints for example yeah definitely so conditions uh this is the best way to think about it conditions imagine you're a seed right <laughs> imagine you're a seed and it's bare ground and you're this far under the soil Mm -hmm. and it rains and you're this far into the soil and all the water runs off no water infiltrates down to you right and that's your life for the last five years you're in this kind of desert scape but now imagine a couple things here so you're a seed um imagine a cow pees five feet from you poops 10 feet from you uh but its hoof print is right above you so the hoof print going into and cracking that 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 soil profile seems destructive for a moment but then take a rainfall all of a sudden while the rain's flowing off the rest of the land it pockets in that little uh dam that was built by that footprint and it pockets right above you and so you're saying oh i'm having water now infiltrate slowly forced to percolate down to me and now i have conditions to say oh i can actually have enough water to to start and so you start the process and several of your other friends had the same thing happen to them. And they say, oh, we're the latent seed bank. It's a word, uh, it's a couple words that are important. Latent seed bank means that we see complete destruction and annihilation of landscapes, but there are seeds and spores waiting. Okay, so now the spore of mycorrhizal fungi, for example, that's been dormant too, uh, senses that there's the urea and the, and the cow pie nearby. And it starts to say, oh, I can get enough nutrition that I can start to feed this plant because I'm, I'm going under the soil, burrowing through the soil, finding the source of that nutrients from the cow pie. And now I can feed the plants all around me for a very long time with one cow pie. So all of a sudden you're now exploding the, the flora, I mean, the, the biology underneath the soil that's becoming alive again. And so you had all these little pockets of where the rain slowed down and infiltrated. And within a year, you can have uh, native 
grasses coming back. And then those conditions set the stage for even the king grasses, the deeper rooted perennial grass systems that say, oh, the conditions are ready for us to come back now. Because this time when it rained, we slowed the water with the hoof prints, but also the grasses made it so when the, the rain hit, it didn't just you know cap off the soil even more. It like percolates down slower. So you're creating conditions for what is the dominant native species to ultimately come back. So conditions, conditions, conditions can be created such that uh, ecosystem repairs itself and we don't have to be out there Johnny apple seeding our way to regeneration. The seeds are waiting in almost every, every ecosystem. Mm, I hope that painted enough of a picture and wasn't super confusing, but yeah. No, that paints a little picture. bit, a little bit of the story. So animals are, are part of the story to reversing the effects of climate change. And just to geek out even further, you can let a grassland go by itself that's used to being grazed by animals. But if there aren't animals there, the grass will go too high. It'll shade out too much of the, the ground. It'll oxidize at the bottom of where the, the, the plant meets the soil and it'll kill itself if it's not grazed. But if it's grazed, you have a carbon pump happening. So you have grasses. Sorry, I'm not gonna be able to do this with my hand holding the camera here. But you have a grass here and the roots match the, the height of the grass going down approximately. So with a carbon pumping system, your cows come and munch half the grass and the plant says, oh no, I have less photosynthesis. So I have to shrink my root system back. So it shrinks its root system back, but all that excess carbon in the roots now becomes uh, content for the microorganisms to eat and, and turn into soil down below. Then that plant grows back and the roots grow again and they grow deeper and further and the plant grows more vigorously. Then the cows come again and they eat off some of the grass after it's grown back and they poop and pee and fertilize and then that roots go back and they, so you're having a carbon pump system created when you're doing grazing properly. Uh, but if you have grass and you have cows eating whatever they want, like the image that a lot of us have of cattle is just an open field where cows are sprinkled everywhere versus doing rotational dense grazing. You have cows come and eat what they want. Then the grass shrinks down, the roots shrink down, right? Then the cow says, oh, I like that grass. It comes back and eats that grass down. The roots shrink back. And then your susceptibility to drought and and other issues or even you know pulling that grass all the way out are very real and so you're desertifying rather quickly uh, your landscape because your cows are overgrazing so you can have both undergrazing and overgrazing mob grazing is taking animals in a big herd into a section for one day or less in you know 100 animals in less than an acre they trample a third of the grass, eat a third of the grass, leave a third of the grass standing and poop and pee. They don't come back to that spot for four, five, six months. When they come back, it's prolific. It's fertilized like crazy. It's going crazy. And then the, the, the different uh, species of grasses come back and the animals like to eat that. It's more healthy for them. The farmer's making more money because they have to import less hay because they have more feed. It's a regenerative system. You can watch a video called A Regenerative Secret that I did with uh, an amazing practitioner named Dr. Alan Williams. So you can YouTube that one. It's about eight minutes. It's a nice little encapsulation of the regenerative process of grazing. Yeah. And so desertification, I think I said that right. You spoke that word. Can you just let us know what is desertification? As Alan Savory says in Kiss the Ground, the film, it's, it's just a, it's a complex term that means land that's turning to desert. Okay. Um, desertification just, just means that we're, we're basically, um, taking off too much vegetation that the land isn't able to self-heal um, and, and self-regenerate. So when we overgraze, when we till ground and leave it bare, uh, we are setting the conditions for desertification because when that soil, remember I talked about the, the glues being made in the soil when the plants pump carbon mm -hmm. sugar in, the microorganisms make glue. If everyone can remember when you pull up uh, some grass and there's little dangling clumps of soil, Mm -hmm. Those are glued together soil particles. When you expose those, try it. Try it in your, you probably try it in your garden or at some point. Imagine when you're watering your garden onto those little aggregates. You're exploding them and they're turning into broken apart aggregates that then are, are vulnerable to flooding and, and uh, not uh, infiltrating the water. So you're breaking soil structure, which is such a bad thing. Okay, so it's the dead soil. Desertification is is what's created. Yeah, desertification soil. is yeah created when plants aren't in the picture. Mm. So with you know, there's a narrative out there that veganism is the way to 
shift climate change. And there's also another narrative out there that that's not, it's not the way animals are part of it. And so is there anything that comes up for you on how humans can eat to support soil health? What Great question. Can eat? Yeah. I think this has been, a, I think this has been an unfortunate um, case of what I called earlier, just like people latching on and not thinking enough. You know, we have a lack of of critical thought and we have a lack of holistic thinking in this country and the world arguably but so if someone just decides to be vegan hypothetically because the CAFO confined animal feeding operations system is terrible it's not only bad for the animals and cruel and inhumane to the animals but it's also setting up a system where the food and the water but the food primarily that those animals are being fed is being grown on land that's being uh, turn to desert or <laughs> degenerative agriculture. So you can look at that system and be like, this is really bad. It is really bad. There's not a question of that, I don't think, for most people. Uh, where we get a little bit nuanced, though, is you can say, okay, well, for two-thirds of their life or half of their life, at least, cows are on grass. Um, baby cows are with their mothers on grass. That's always the case. And before they're brought to get fattened up at the feedlots, so in that model, that part of it, you can have a regenerative system before they're sent to the feedlot. You can have animals that are working to build back the soil, make more biomass, regenerate the land. So that can be a part of a, an actual building ecosystems, helping water, uh, watersheds be or springs come back, et cetera. And even better than that, when farmers and ranchers are doing regenerative grazing right, they're able to reduce their input costs. They're able to feed their cows enough on that land to fatten them up enough that they don't need to be sent to the CAFO to get fattened up. So they can do everything on that land. And then arguably now the cow is net positive as a, a great uh, study that was done at White Oak Pastures here in Georgia uh, that showed that the cows on that land are actually doing net positive greenhouse gas equivalent. Uh, they're sequestering carbon. Um, versus you know the fake meat lab which is carbon mm. positive putting out putting out uh, carbon so it really 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 depends if you can't find ways to support regenerative agriculture and soil choosing vegan can be good but I say watch watch your context there because you know eating backyard eggs from your neighbor um, is definitely a better calorie per calorie punch off and if those are done well than going and buying organic carrots from California that were were farmed in a very degenerative way where they're creating desert because of how many, you know, large conventional organic, I call it, uh, that's done out in California, for example, that's not good for anything. And it's not even nutritious to eat because the, the soil's dead. So it really depends. Uh, if you wanna help build soil, you have to look into where your food is coming from. Yeah, what I received from that, and, and I was vegan for six and a half years because I thought I was doing my part for the environment. And and, and honestly, that. good on people. I mean, that the strength of that choice is huge anyway, just a nod to people who made that because it's hard to do in today's society. So it's no strong, no easy feat to do that. And I, I acknowledge it first and foremost, because that means you're someone who has power in your decisions. And we just, mm -hmm. I think we need to angle those a little bit more to supporting and making sure we're actually building ecosystems back. Yeah. Yeah. And, and on my journey, you know, I recently decided to bring meat back into my diet because my body was asking for it. And what I've noticed and what's felt really good and what I received from, from what you were speaking to was buying locally, getting the eggs from my local farmer that's just down the road and eating meat that is locally produced and all of that. So it, it feels like that ancestral way, again, of knowing your farmer and creating that relationship and eating the foods that are close to you yeah. as opposed yeah. to, you know, I, what was a big decision for me was like, I'm eating these beyond meat burgers that God knows what is in them. That is. And where, where they're from and, you know, who's winning in that story, you know, yeah. what's the corporation that's decentral uh, that's centralizing, pardon me. Uh, the, the the means of production. And that's where, again, like you look around the world, especially in arid environments, you can't have a system in a lot of these arid environments where you're like, hey, you should do row cropping of kale and just all the kale. Be like, 
the row cropping is going to turn this into desert really quick. If we reestablish native perennial grass systems and do rotational grazing, that's what that ecosystem is asking for. Uh, yeah, there used to be wild herds that came through here, but humans have done what humans do. How are we now going to accommodate for that and figure out what to do? It doesn't mean like, you know, books are coming out that I'm very against right now, which are like argued from people from England. You're like, yo, England's way of farming that worked in England because it's like constantly humid and rains 90% of the year. And when you degenerate the soil, it it's almost automatically. England shouldn't be prescribing anybody anywhere ever again methodologies of farming. I mean, they've destroyed whatever 50% of the world because they went to Australia and were like, we know how to farm. Be like, you don't know how to farm Australia. You turned it to a desert in a good seven years. So there's there's context that's so important where people are like now writing books, a certain Mr. Moonboot, whatever his name is, like you're talking about letting nature back nature and recovering itself. That works in England. That works in where I come from in upstate New York. It doesn't work everywhere. We've desertified so many parts of this world that are already arid environments. They need to come back to grassland. How are they going to get back to grassland? No one's answering that question. And that's where animals integrating comes in. They have to be there. Yeah. So with... So it's, it's so context-based, you know? Yeah. I think that's really beautiful on a collective level is what is going to heal the soil in Western Canada where I am is going to be different from what's going to heal the soil in Eastern Canada or Australia. And what is native to my land is, you know... But the principles different. of regenerative ag... Yeah. The principles of regenerative ag are universal. The practices are what change. So you're hundred percent right. Like the details of those principles are what have to be contextually relevant in your own place. Exactly. Exactly. And we have to learn a lot from indigenous, indigenous knowledge. There's people who've, you know, on the West coast, like we went a good, whatever, 150 years of not knowing how to manage with fire. And it has caused so much destruction. Like we had people just sitting there knowing this knowledge and no one was listening to them. Stupid. Biggest mistake for the West, you know? Like, there's a lot of that. It's really sad. Yeah. But it has to be paid attention to because we say that regenerative agriculture can't happen without this combination because of where we're at right now. You need indigenous place-based knowledge to start the, the historical context of what was. You can't know what was and how to get back to it without having historical relevance of what, how it was before. You can't do what we need to do, where you need to do it without holistic thinking and that practitioner mindset because we do have highways and byways. We can't all just go back to wildness everywhere. We have what we have. We have to start with where we're at. And we need the science. And arguably, in a lot of cases, we need technology to, to come in and help behind the regenerative context not leading, not solving everything with technology, but those three pillars for me are absolutely essential to overlap. And right now, technology has like this much attention. Holistic management has like this much attention and indigenous place-based knowledge has like this much. They all need to be at the same level. And that's, that's where I'm pushing. Mm. So regenerate America. That's a movement in the States. Is that, that correct on a yes. political level to start to bring in regenerative agriculture on a, yes. a larger scale? Yeah, so um, the, the United States Farm Bill, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, the United States Farm Bill is an $856 billion bill that dictates most of the subsidies, meaning what farmers are given to help them uh, in this country. And right now about 1% of that goes to helping farmers actually build their soil back and ranchers build their soil back. We're saying, what if that 1% was actually 3 to 5%? Uh, imagine what that could do to propel the regeneration of our country and our soils, which is our security in so many, so many ways back to health. Uh, so Regenerate America is a coalition campaign. The, the motto is soil is our common ground. Uh, we, we have been actively pursuing and creating a, a list of priorities for the farm bill to change so that the regenerative uh, capacity of the United States agriculture is greatly enhanced. We have uh, almost 100 coalition members from brands to farm groups to uh, organizations that have come together in this unprecedented coalition. And we're really asking folks to get involved, come to the table to help and propel this forward. This is absolutely critical. The Farm Bill only gets voted on every five years. 
And if we don't get this one at least shifted uh, in a big way, we are going to continue to support degenerative agriculture and desertifying our entire country. Uh, and we're, we're in such a vulnerable place anyway with all the climate chaos. Uh, we have to become more resilient and we have to help our farmers uh, do this economically well uh, in this transition. So how do people like the average person support? Go to regenerateamerica.com uh, and sign up to support. Start sharing the content that we have there. Um, share Kiss the Ground the movie with your friends still. Share any Kiss the Ground movie content with people. Tell them that this campaign is absolutely essential. Uh, take soil advocate training to get better equipped as an advocate. Uh, but if you are in key districts that have representatives who are on the House Ag Committee, please um, you know, contact us individually about that. Um, policy at kisstheground.com. Uh, so we're, we're in for a big, a big push and we're really looking for all the help we can get. Uh, so, but yeah, first and foremost, go to regenerateamerica.com and sign up. Beautiful. I don't know if anything comes up for you around this. There's a, a narrative out there that kind of the small farmers are being bought or wiped out and, you know, a lot of the farmlands being turned to monocrops, grasshoppers, bugs, that kind of stuff. And so there's kind of this wiping out of your local farmer. How do we shift that? Does anything come up for you around that? So, you know, this government wiping out the, the small farms, how do we shift that? Yeah, I think there's two things. Number one is support Regenerate America because we're working to, to help the small farmers and the medium-sized farmers succeed and be successful mm -hmm. in today's world, especially as they're trying to transition and save uh, their own money and make themselves more resilient. Um, but there, there are other ways too. There's a great map from Regeneration International. You can go to regenerationinternational.org and check out their farm map. Uh, there's another group that we're friends with. Uh, Regenerative Farmers of America has a great map that you can start to plug in and buy directly from a lot of these farms that are doing it. This signal is huge. I mean, there's brands right now who are just jumping into this full force. Uh, collectively, the movement is doing amazing work. We're getting incredible resounding uh, from the biggest corporations seeing that their supply chains are vulnerable, that they need to transition to something that's more long-term and uh, resilient, uh, all the way to the small farmers who are saying, I can't do this input cost thing anymore because their inputs just went up three and a half to four times during this UK Ukraine crisis and inflation. And now they're, they're, they're really suffering. So um, supporting them directly, but um, policy has to change uh, in order to shift how they're being supported. And we can do that collectively through Regenerate America. Okay, beautiful. There, uh, just a clothing company comes to mind and I just want to share it for everybody listening. Christy Dawn, there's these clothing companies oh, yeah. that RS, are all about- RS and Christy are, are great friends of mine. RS okay. and I used to play music together back in the day in Venice. And uh, yeah, I remember when they first met a long time ago. Yeah. And I think it's important to know where your clothes are coming from, your food's coming from, all that kind of stuff and support the regenerative movement. Can you just speak to compost tea for a moment? Um, yeah, sure. I, I do have to jump, unfortunately, in just this one minute. I know we had longer, but I, someone in my team scheduled me for something. So I do have to jump right at the hour here. Um, okay. Yes, compost and everyone should compost first and foremost. If you have a hang up about it, get over it. The world needs you to start composting. Put your compost in your freezer so it doesn't make your significant other or someone pissed off that you're having flies in the house. Just put the receptacle in the freezer. Make a compost bin outside. Use some leaves to throw on your compost so it doesn't get stinky. Do it. We have compost videos to help you. Um, compost tea is awesome. It's definitely hard. You know, it's kind of like if you're into that kind of thing of getting into it, you can do it. There are plenty of YouTube videos to help you do it for your common person, like for me, for example, it's on my to-do list, but it's it's something mm. that you have to have certain equipment to do it really well. Um, and again, I, I really encourage people to do it, but the, the beautiful thing about it is you can multiply by millions and billions uh, your compost where you're saying, oh, because you're essentially creating probiotic upon probiotic and these things breed very quickly, you can have healthy compost that turns into a compost tea that's gonna be able to be sprayed over way more distance in, in a, of your land than just your compost was. So 
definitely mm. support compost tea. It's just, it's something not for the, the, the weak spirited to like take on and do well. So not for the faint of heart. Okay. Beautiful. <laughs> well, thank you so much. For Thanks this so conversation. much. And it'll be in the show notes where everybody can follow you and all that magic. And thank you for your medicine. Thanks so much. World. Appreciate you. Talk soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for joining me for an episode of the Phoenix Rising podcast. Please like, share, download, subscribe if you enjoyed this episode. And I will see you next week for another episode on the Phoenix Rising podcast. Sending so much love.